from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello, everyone. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming. I know a few of you were at the first luncheon that we had, and so your support is really great and really appreciate it. This one, uh, the Library of Congress Deaf Association sponsored this event, so I want to thank you for that. And this was a series. The first, I do want to talk about my internship. I'm an intern here at the Library of Congress. During my time, I was responsible for planning events, and these are the three that I chose. Some of you came, and some of you were actually involved in the panel for that one, so that was really cool. The first one was techno technology and telecommunications. Today, we're going to be talking about deaf art, what it looks like, what it represented, and some of the behind meanings for deaf art. The last one will be within two weeks and it will focusing, be focusing on preserving American deaf culture. There is a fourth one, uh, and it's not listed. It's different than deaf culture. It's one that's specific to my family. Uh, I'm of Samoa t Samoan heritage, and so it will delve into the cultures of Samoa. So now uh, we will be talking about Divya. If you don't know this term, uh, here it is. A little bit of my background, uh, how I became interested with Divya. I'm a student at Eastern Kentucky University, which is where I came from to do my internship. And uh, in, there was one art class that had such a wide range of art. They focused on poetry, art, sculptures, and a wide range of things, and that piqued my interest. Before I want to show you one of these pictures that really means something to me, I want to talk a little bit about my, uh, my family dynamic, and I come from a family of, five and, uh, of six brothers and sisters, and this is my older sister, um, Karen, and She's awesome, just to let you know. Um, <laughs> and she was older than me. And probably when I was five years old, she had already gone to Gallaudet University. And she was already a student there. So we had quite an age gap. And as I was growing up, I didn't use sign language. Um, I watched people sign. But I was able to watch and be exposed to some, some of the letters, some of the basic colors and some basic language exposure at that time. As <clears throat> I'm trying to give a summary of, <laughs> of what happens, but um, at the school they provided an ASL class when I was in high school. Probably around my sophomore year in high school uh, when I went in and I started to take ASL, ASL courses. At the time my sister was teaching at San Diego State University and I had asked if she would sit down with me on a weekly basis and so that I could learn more and study more of her language and could improve my skills. She was obviously willing to do this for me and through our lessons um, I was able to develop not only a relationship with her but also develop my language. We were sisters, and so we had that relationship. But I realized that through more language acquisition, that our, um, our relationship was surface growing up because we didn't have the same language to use. As I started to learn um, at that time, then I moved to Kentucky. And so my language classes they halted because I wasn't able to work with her anymore. But 
then once I got to Kentucky and settled, then we started our courses again. None of my other brothers and sisters knew ASL. Still to this day, they don't. So for me to be able to have the relationship with my sister is great, but none of the other family members seem to learn. So understanding that there were six of us, so it's a lot. How Davia really, impacted. really impacted me uh, was by Warren Miller. This is an example, and it's called Family Tradition. And I wanted to show this because my sister is one of six. And so you can see the whole family here. And then down in the corner, there's one that seems to be excluded. All of them are having conversations and seem to be involved. But then there's one that's excluded. And it seems that, that that's to be characterized. That's what happens in families, that there's always speech happening, and then that there's one that's sort of neglected. So when I first saw this, I was quite emotional. Uh, I even cry, broke out and cry. even broke out in tears seeing this because it had such an impact and was symbolic of the family that I grew up with. Having one deaf child in such a large hearing family, this is truly a representation of that. Yes, I'm able to hear myself, but the relationship that I had with my sister, I started to embody some of the, and understand some of the oppression through her identity. And understand her as a deaf woman. Then to even understand her as a deaf woman. And then everybody knows the I love you handshake, and that's <laughs> seen within this fingerprint, and it shows a true embodiment of the deaf culture and the deaf identity. It becomes part of who you are, and that you know, I want to support the deaf community, I want to be involved, I want the language acquisition. Yes, I'm motivated to learn the language, but it's also to become an ally and within the community and to really immerse myself in the culture and the language. So now I want to introduce <laughs> the, the expert here of Divya. Uh, that's not me. Uh, I'm a student, still learning, but Lenore knows so much and she's able to in-depth explain about Divya and what it is. She has some historical context about what the art is and some of the importance of it. And do you remember which slide is first? Hello, everyone. Uh, let me introduce myself uh, briefly. Uh, I've worked here for uh, quite some time, for eight, years. for eight years, and many of you know me. Uh, in graduate school, I took uh, courses and I have a degree in art history. European American art. And I... European American art. And studied European American art. Now, I have been here at the Library of Congress for eight years, but I've been in Maryland for about 20 years. I graduated from Gallaudet University, and as I moved here from Pennsylvania, I ended up staying here. This is uh, uh, my home yeah. because of the uh, very large deaf community. I went to Western Pennsylvania School for the Deaf in Pittsburgh, and when I moved here, I decided to stay here, you know, for cultural reasons. Uh, I don't have deaf in my family as well, and in my small hometown back in Pennsylvania, there's uh, not a deaf community, and so this is like home for me. So let's talk a little bit today about Davia. We're going to look at multiple perspectives about uh, deaf artists. Oh, thank you, Michaela. You're Quick on the draw there. So deaf artists have a long uh, tradition of creating art, uh, both traditional and contemporary art. And deaf art incorporates the language and culture of deaf artists. So there are so many different aspects of culture and history, uh, our bodies, our sign language, that are all included in Davia. So there are many components of Davia, and these are listed here, high contrast of colors and images, uh, facial expressions, the movement of uh, our hands, our eyes, our mouths. Um, you'll see so many different things incorporated in our 
in our art. And oftentimes you'll see us uh, talking about other people's focus on our ears. But deaf uh, art is focuses on American Sign Language. Uh, hello again. <laughs> so this is kind of a sh short timeline that depicts Divya uh, from its original start until today. So the first box, it's, it talks about the time in the 1960s when they started to realize that there was uh, a divergence and kind of a difference in the art at that time. It was in the 60s and there wasn't too much of an established and announced culture at that time. So there was one group, the Deaf Art Movement, and a group of deaf students came together and they started to analyze and look at what is art and what is the impact. And that's where they came up with Divya. A few years later, a person, a woman named Medi Betty Miller, and that was in 1972, Betty Miller, she was known as the grandmother of Divya. And the reason for that was it was the first all deaf art exhibit that she had curated. And it was called The Silent World. And that was in 1972. Then in 89, when in deaf art, there were a group of nine artists that came together and they really wanted to look at how can we make this more profound? How can we make this have more of a movement? We looked at, they looked at what the manifesto was, what the murals, and what kind of impact that they wanted Davia to have on the overall culture. Another organization, Deaf Artists of America, DAA, They created an entire exhibit uh, that was a full gallery of different art, different preservations, and different exhibits that were curated at that time. And then the big celebration came at the 25th anniversary. What I was really excited about, though, was this, the Kentucky Deaf Fest. <laughs> and so, like I said, I, was from Kentu I am from Kentucky. And I was there during this year. And so the Kentucky Deaf Fest, it's a biannual festival. And when I saw Davia, I didn't really know what it meant at that time, that it was so all-encompassing of other facets. It also had skits with different artists. There were comedians. They told stories. And they had different child exhibits as well. So it was a full range of activities for all of the participants. So if you ever have a chance to go, they have food as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> so the 2012 was two years prior. And then, in 2014. then they had the next event, which was in 2014. And this is where it continued to grow into numerous other events and continued to celebrate the culture. There was one example uh, at this event is when they highlighted Davia. And it was a true festival at that time. And they really were able to spread the word about Davia and what the art's impact was. If you wouldn't mind, I'd like to talk about the timeline a little bit. The curator of Davia and the different exhibits, it's hard, you know, time has flown over the years, so I don't have exact dates and times in mind. But um, I went within, to a deaf Davia. Within three Divia. years, within three years uh, folks are hoping to organize another Davia exhibit in the next three years. So hopefully the timeline will continue. I know it's a lot, but if you want to go ahead and read this, uh, this was really important about who Dr. Betty Miller was and the creation of Davia. And then quote from her. this is a, a, the quote from her, and it really talks about her art. 
So this was who we had referred to previously as the grandmother of Livia. And I also wanted to mention that she did just recently pass. So I'd like to uh, expand on De Villa through looking at actual artwork. Uh, here you see two hands that are chained and fingers that are mangled. And this was about the prohibition of American Sign Language. For so many years, American Sign Language, even in deaf schools, uh, had a focus on oralism, people learning to hear and to speak, and not on sign language. And Betty Miller, remember her age, and at her time, this was uh, a very prevalent uh, an, unfortunate an unfortunate experience in the, in the deaf community, not one that I had experienced. Now, in deaf schools, it's very common for folks to, uh, teachers and audiologists, to focus on our ears and on our speech. And so hearing tests were a daily part of life, and speech training was a daily part of life, but it was very arduous. Uh, because the, imp the, the, the sense was that if you're going to go out into the big wide world, you need to be able to, to speak. You need to be able to use your hearing. And I have, uh, you know, education in math and, and all of my regular studies, and I enjoyed those classes, but I hated going to speech training. I just, um, I can't tell you uh, can't what imagine. that experience is uh, for me. And I can't imagine uh, Betty's experience at that time. Now, this is Chuck Baird. He's a deaf artist and one of the founders of uh, Devia. He passed away uh, two years ago. So here's his all-American breakfast. Can you see it here? Now, some deaf people, I think you can see this and you'll catch on pretty quickly. But the syrup is in the shape of a hand. Devia incorporates sign language into the artwork itself. And so uh, when we sign syrup, they, the artist actually depicted the hands as the bottle. Mm -hmm. Now in this one, art number two, again a focus on sign language. You'll notice that it's backlit by the heart and it's focusing on art. These are, uh, you may not be able to see them, but they're uh, paintbrushes and pencils and so forth. Now this is artwork by Paul Johnston. He's a professor at Gallaudet uh, University and one of my professors and a great <coughs> teacher. I really enjoyed him as a professor and also as a friend. And he'll be retiring this May and he is thrilled to start traveling and now being able to focus on his own art in retirement. So this piece, Poetic Hand, shows the expression of American Sign Language in not just conversation, but poetically and musically and rhythmically. And I think you can see the movement in the picture itself. It really uh, focuses on the beauty of American Sign Language. In this piece, The Theory of Language, There are five factors that are included features of Devia. as features of Devia. <coughs> so the hands, and of course your mind, your eyes, because it's a visual language and a visual art form. And of course, we all still have this uh, struggle with uh, speech that often gets represented in the artwork itself. But mostly the incorporation of hands and eyes. not focusing on the ears but focusing on the eyes. Mm -hmm. And so these are the kind of building blocks, the features of Devia, the theory of language itself, using the eyes, the ears, the hands, the, the mouth, and the brain. And, and they all come together in the, a theory of language, all right? This is Susan DePore. She lives in Wisconsin. 
and she's an artist there at a deaf school in Wisconsin. Teacher. And as a teacher, uh, she thinks a lot and incorporates the experiences of children in her artwork. This is Deaf American, and you'll notice what's in her hand. She doesn't look really happy. She says, I don't know, this is what I have, a hearing aid. And it shows her contempt for uh, the hearing aids being forced. And that was a similar experience for me for so many years. Everyone was focused on me wearing hearing aids that were just noise to me. And I really have enjoyed the day that I was able to get rid of my hearing aids and enjoy peace and quiet. <laughs> Now this is uh, entitled The Family Dog. Now this is maybe her view of her family or maybe cousins or being at a, a family gathering uh, that she feels uh, fenced off and <coughs> not a part of the family. And Susan depicted herself as a dog while everyone else in the family is participating in conversation and the, the business of the family and she had felt left out and ignored. And uh, this is her stark portrayal of feeling like the family pet. And I need to say that this was an experience that I had in my family as well. Because my family had no experience with deaf people, nor the language, uh, my mom would fingerspell and she had home signs. For example, uh, she would, in ASL, this is the sign for school. My, mo my mom's version of it was this, because she thought, oh, you go to the place where you hold books. Uh, so that was her sign. The, uh, so and so at Christmas or at Thanksgiving, you know, the family is all there together, but it was still a lonely time for me. And, uh, you know, I would talk to the family and say, uh, hey, what are you guys talking about? Could you tell me? And it was really hard for them. And even to this day, um, you know, families that don't sign don't understand that experience. Oh, yeah. Tell them about the whole, we'll tell you later, we'll tell you later concept. Right. Um, I think that's, that's an important thing, Michaela. Uh, oftentimes, deaf people in a family or a group will say, hey, what are you talking about? And they're like, oh, don't worry, we'll tell you later. And that's such a common experience that often happens to us uh, in hearing families. And, uh, you know, now Pete, uh, you all know Pete Ritchie here, he is really fortunate. He comes from a family where his father is deaf, you, you, you know Alex Ritchie, and uh, his mother is deaf, and they come from a deaf family. And there are hearing people in the family who do sign, but as a deaf person, Pete never would have had this concept of, of a family because he comes from a deaf family with a full language intact. So, I you know, my parents were deaf. I wish my parents were deaf. Now, let's talk about the history of deaf education in Milan in the 1880s. Uh, American Sign Language was under scrutiny there was an announcement in the education world that sign language would forever be forbidden in the education of deaf people. And that was the, the, the theory that was being promoted at that time. That the best thing for deaf people was to hear and to speak and not to use sign language that separated them from the world. And so, uh, there was a large uh, education, educational influence that, at that time by Alexander Graham Bell, and I'm sure you know of him. Now, let's look over at this painting here. Uh, do you know Goya's painting, The Third of May? Okay, and this is an actual uh, event. This is a depiction of an actual event that happened where uh, people were being murdered, and uh, you understand that history, and this deaf artist incorporated that said that this was almost the murder of ASL. It was almost the, the time that American Sign Language had its demise. And this is by artist Mary Jane Thornley. She had seen that artwork and she got the idea of, wow, I could portray something uh, like that using American Sign Language in my art. 
Now this is Nancy Rourke. She's a well-known artist and uh, she lives in Colorado and she and I are good friends and I have uh, much of her artwork in my house. Uh, I have Chuck, some of Chuck Baird's uh, pieces as well and I really value those because you know they're uh, since he has passed. But this is Nancy Rourke's artwork. So this one on the on your left says the fifth grade experience. It's a self-portrait. And I, the artist is portraying herself as a doll with the eyes crossed out with a large uh, box uh, which is her hearing aid. Her <coughs> with button eyes and a mouth that's closed in stitches as well. And the, the focus was for her not to see and not, to, but to actually focus on hearing. And these FM systems, the phonic ears, they were, um, they were so bulky. Can you imagine being a little kid out in the play, playground and trying to play ball with the other kids and having this phonic ear on you, bouncing around and the ear pieces falling out? So this is her depiction of the hearing community. Now she was in a mainstream school, meaning that she was a deaf person in uh, a regular classroom with all hearing people. And this was her identity, that uh, the other kids would make fun of her because she had to wear this big clunky uh, uh, hearing aid. And she had really felt alone and depressed, even being in a mainstream school. Now this, piece is called Coalition Peak. And Coalition Peak is uh, a concept about Devia. And in France, they also had a, a sortist in France. The uh, they have uh, a movement of the sortists in France, the deaf community. And so they were talking about the deaf art movement and the American art movement being in coalition. And so they took an image here of Viditz who uh, was from the National Association of the Deaf and their view of American Sign Language as showing, uh, needing to survive. And so here's the word defend that, and portraying that we need to defend American Sign Language from the waves of oralism and oppression. And those waves for, for so many years often uh, affect the deaf community and continue to affect the deaf community. And it's the work of artists to build a mountain that protects the deaf community from these waves of oppression and oralism. And so again, that's the word defense. Uh, preserving our culture, defending our culture, and cherishing it as a value of ours. Oh, okay. Uh, this is Tony Landon McGregor, a deaf artist who is also Native American. He incorporated not only his deaf experience, but his Native American experience in his artwork. His art is so beautiful, it's hard for the, the this PowerPoint to show, show this to you. This is a gourd and he has decorated it in a Native American uh, style and themes with American Sign Language incorporated into the images. So you can see the animals and this is very typical of Native American art. Here's another depiction entitled ASL Eagle Painting. Again, a Native American experience of uh, incorporating animals and, and nature, natural themes. He now lives in Texas. This is a landscape from Texas. And you'll see the landscape here. And then these are hand shapes that show not the word eagle, but the forms of the, the wings, the claws, and the head and the beak and the eye. Mary Rapazzo uh, grew up in California and a lot of her artwork is, in, is shown in many galleries. She's hard of hearing, but she has an experience of being deaf and she considers herself as some, a person who lives in two worlds. So she talked here about deaf people in, in a march and coming together as one voice to support 
and to speak out about the diversity of deaf culture and to uh, relinquish, oppression. relinquish oppression. And so this was uh, one of the marches, and the deaf community has marched uh, so often in its history for its rights. So this is something that talks about the importance of people coming together and speaking up with one voice for issues they believe in. This one is called the Learning Circle. And here are people that are uh, talking as they're uh, studying. But if you'll notice here, uh, the other person is reading and there's a person outside of the window and they want to be involved, but they can't be involved in the educational experience. And so they feel, this is an artwork that, that depicts someone feeling as an outsider. And this is similar to the other theme that you saw earlier in the family dog uh, painting. And how uh, also talking about like DPN, the deaf president now, uh, and how that relates. Some hearing people don't know about deaf president. Some uh, people may not know about DPN, deaf president now, and that was what in 88, 89, uh, the spring of, uh, right. Well, and if you were here in DC at that time, you knew about uh, deaf pre the deaf president now. Uh, so a little bit of history uh, ab about that is that there was a president of Gallaudet who was a person who uh, is hearing and not a deaf person. And when they were electing a new president, they decided to hire a hearing person. And the deaf people uh, were enraged. And there was a huge protest uh, covered in, in national and international news. And the deaf people had to speak up with one voice to get what they wanted. They wanted a deaf person to lead a deaf institution. And so uh, deaf president now prevailed, and I. King Jordan was named as president of Gallaudet University. And so uh, that was definitely one great example in the history of the deaf community of people coming together with one voice. This is Ellen Mansfield. She lives uh, nearby in Frederick, Maryland. She graduated from New York Art College uh, and had moved here and has lived here uh, continuing Different media uh, working in various uh, art forms and, and art genres. She knows that, uh, that some deaf schools, the education uh, or a mainstreaming school uh, puts a person out on the streets if they don't get a quality of education. And so um, she has uh, really been a proponent of using American Sign Language as a way to teach uh, deaf children, not to use what's called TC, total communication, where you sign and speak at the same time. And so what she's saying is that um, this is the result of oppression, that over, the, over time you can actually be out on the streets and end up being a, a, a beggar. And that's uh, one of the effects that deaf people do know in, in society. And the goal uh, from this artist's view is to have American Sign Language for full inclusion and education of deaf people. So this is her self-portrait, so self uh, I Will Never Forget. She went to a mainstreaming school and it was, a, and she was a product of oral education. Uh, she terms itself here the victims of oral education. It was an experience that was ingrained on her that sign language was not valued, that only speaking and only hearing uh, was valued in society. It wasn't until way later. And it wasn't until many years later where she learned about American Sign Language. Now she had the experience, and other deaf people have had the experience of being whacked on the hands with uh, wooden spoons and things, rulers, to, uh, to uh, punish them for signing. Now at uh, Western Pennsylvania School for the Deaf in Pittsburgh that I went to, um, 
I heard that there were the days where classes before me had gone through that kind of corporal punishment. And uh, when I came along uh, much later, fortunately for me, they used American Sign Language in deaf education. So this is the last slide and the last art that we had. But I really wanted to focus on this and to really look at the art here and to see the multiple perspectives to figure out what the feelings are when you look at this type of painting. <coughs> when you look at this hunger for ASL, when you hear about the Milan Conference in Italy from 1880, and you really see the emergence from where ASL was previously banned to now an inclusion in mm -hmm. education. So you see that how it's affecting getting jobs, how it affects everything, and the oppression of the language really affects your life in pursuit of happiness. The language and the culture is everything. And understanding for so many, culture is their life. So now would be a great time. We can field some questions if anybody has any. And we would ask that if anyone's going to use sign language, that they could come up to the front of the room. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is LaCoram, and I am from South uh, San Diego in California. Um, I was really excited to be a part of this, and to, it was a great presentation. But I was really excited. What does it mean here to see the black on. hands at the bottom? What is your take on that? What do you think that means? Well, these are hands, uh, the hands of oppression. Oh, and I'm sorry, I need to be over a little bit better for the uh, filming. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, so these images show um, the, uh, the depression, the, uh, the anger, the, neg the negative aspects, because they weren't allowed to sign. They were starved for ASL. And it's almost like uh, the hands are dead, that they don't, um, they're lifeless. And you'll notice again, this other image is framed in, in darkness as well. Yeah, I did notice that dark at the side. Thank you very much. Other, other questions, if anybody? I know there are several members of the audience that are deaf, so if anybody wants to comment, they could come. Fred, you want to come up? Yeah, please. Hello, everybody. You know, as I'm looking at this art, uh, I think this is really great. Uh, I know there was the one with the family that showed everybody was just talking while the deaf person stands at the sidelines and isn't included. And that happens when people, as I was born, I was born deaf and I was a military brat. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, that experience was even more incredible. So it was... And I was a brat. I really, and uh, speaking of military brat, I was a brat. You know, I often <laughs> spoke out and and was in New York. And when my mom, got, when we got there, I was in Ellis Island and the family, uh, we were in New York and we tried to go out. And I, my whole family was excited to go out one day and do something. But I was deaf and so was my brother. My brother and... So what I would do, I would start to pick on people to get attention. So you know, it was the way that I had to act out so that I could get attention. And so every member of my family, that was my way to get attention. I would just pester and pester and pester until I could finally get attention and get access to what people were saying. So I wasn't lonesome, but I got attention. I wasn't you, know, you know, no one enjoyed that, but it was the only way that I could get attention. In Providence, Rhode Island, my experience for education was signing was banned as well. It was all speech focused. It was, it's called an oral approach and so you know, we had to just put your hands down and practice speaking. And people often said, you know, 
I had deaf voice. deaf voice and things like that. But I learned sign language way later, probably. Until I was 14 or 15. Probably no sign language exposure until I was 14, 15 years old. And so thank God for Kendall School for the Deaf, which is in Washington, D.C., near Gallaudet. So happy that you know I could finally embrace and find peace with a deaf identity. Like Lenore said about this FM system, this big box with these bulky ear things, to finally just get rid of that. And to see, I don't know how you hearing people deal with the sounds every day, <laughs> um, but you know, I am deaf, I am being deaf. proud deaf, um, and I was born deaf, and so I know how, how happy I am, so thank you. Other, other comments? Yeah, come on up. Can't see you. <laughs> Hello everybody, uh, I'm Alex Ritchie. And I was born and raised in a deaf family. I went to a school for the deaf, and it was in the 50s. I was six at the time when I was in first grade, and we were able to sign at the deaf school. We did practice speech reading every day, and we did do the headphone things. Uh, but there was one teacher specifically that I remember that really struggled with me on how to pronounce the L. I just couldn't get it. And she would get mad at me. And we would fight, and I would get spanked. I got pulled over the knee so many times, and I would sob until the two chairs would go together. They would get all of the students together and throw all of their clothes in, to, in and together and would life. cover me with all of these clothes. And that was really traumatic for me. Uh, and I could never still forgive that teacher for the humiliation at that time. And that was one of the really negative experiences that I had. Still to this time, I know every once in a while, over all of these years, I still feel, you know, humiliated what she did to me in front of all of the other students and how that has still affected me. And so, you know, I never wanted to tell my parents about that because uh, I knew that my father would go after that teacher. But I, I, never, I never told, never did anything. But that was one of my bad experiences of growing up learning oral. Other comments, or does anybody want to share anything else? Is there? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm curious if everybody understands what, um, <laughs> sorry, make sure I'm in the right place. It's interesting, deaf culture, right? How we have to figure out where to stand, how the lights go. <laughs> um, so I was wondering if, People understood when, if the interpreters, when the sign for TC, total communication, if the interpreters really portrayed what that means. And if not, I want to go through a little bit of that to explain what this means, this total communication. It means that the voice you're trying to speak while you're signing at the same time. So you're like focusing on your vocal cords, the mouth patterns. And so there's a situation where you're trying to, your voice always dominates, your voice the, always dominates the sign language. language. And so the signing is no good. It it's lacks. It's muddled. So the person that can sort of hear, you know, I can do that. There are other people that are similar to me. You know, if they have a hearing aid or if they consider themselves hard of hearing, I can lip read and, and look very closely. But once I turn my head, I have no access to that information. And so that specifically only works for that situation. So for this total communication approach, you have to meet people that are exactly similar in that mode of communication. If a deaf person is on the sidelines watching us, they have no idea what's going on. And they have a very hard time understanding. So that's why that mode isn't effective. And ASL is something that I cherish as well. Taking off those hearing aids is fantastic for ASL. And you must. Because once I take my hearing aids off, I'm out as well. You know, I have to think, what happens if my battery dies? You know, then I have to write back and forth, and I'm, I struggle with communication. And it's the same people that I communicate with fine today. Tomorrow, I could be completely in the dark. So just try to imagine that with these deaf children in schools. And most of the teachers that they're growing up with, even if they were at a deaf school, that approach of total communication and their signing and trying to speak at the same time, these children are not able to hear. You have to be able to hear some and have some hearing ability for that, as well as English awareness. 
and other people won't have the exact same experience as you as well. Um, uh, let me add to that, Total Communication, TC, um, was a method of education that uh, was used in deaf schools, but you really didn't get an education. There were signs, uh, but it was still following English word order and word structure, and it was still left to the deaf person to do all the work. And so understanding that we have organizations that are out there that are really supporting and advocating for deaf children as they're born to right away give them access to a visual language. Imagine being born, and I know I already explained some of that. There was a workshop with Craig Anderson that had happened before. One of our, I know one uh, of our power uh, there was one PowerPoint that explained that. A baby is born, they immediately have a access to yeah, language. So really imagine born. a deaf child uh, and other members of the family are all hearing, and they're all talking and communicating while this baby has no absorption of any language. They're not able to pick up anything from that. So there are years of miscommunication, and that's why there's such a delay in education for deaf as well as the development of language. These skills that we're noticing in language are so behind, and when they're able to get into a school, they finally are able to start learning and have exposure to education and the way that things around them work. And notice they're here, they're starving for communication and it's because of the void that they've had for so long. Often we see that the English skills, we notice it looks like a second language learner and like, oh, this person that's deaf is writing in broken English and that's not pro proper grammar. Well, because they didn't learn it until way later in life. They weren't, didn't have access to it until they were five, six years old, so it's terrible. We see that. So I just wanted to mention that, so <laughs> that's all. We got an applause from the deaf audience. So we need to close. One last comment. <laughs> um, sorry, it'll be real short. <laughs> real short. So as we watched what she just said, did you see her facial expressions and the way that, she, that Ellie was when she was talking, She's you can so look animated. and see how animated she really is. That right there is the portrayal of deaf culture. You know, when you can point, some hearing people are like, oh, don't, don't point at me like that. You know, That's that seems to be point. a faux pas in hearing culture. But there's the directness that happens within, and the facial expressions and the animation that happens within the deaf culture, yeah, that that's how we portray things and that's how things Are go. Clear. And when a hearing person is not animated, we see no gesture, we miss out on some of that communication because it's within the voice. And a lot of people misunderstand deaf and when we are really animated, uh, but that's part of the language. Um, yep. Sorry, we have to wrap up. I think there's other people that are trying to use this room. Because yeah. so, yeah. that's, that's, no. there was a topic from the audience that uh, there would be a whole new discussion. Needed a whole bunch. So, okay. Wanted to cite my sources. <laughs> there was no plagiarism. <laughs> And then so remember I told you that there were other upcoming events. There was one more that is deaf culture focused. And the person that's coming here will be Max Williamson. And he will be coming and helping with the presentation and be talking about the past and other movies and the preservation of the language as well as deaf culture. So thank you so much. That is it, and hopefully see you at the next one. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.